Good morning, Hello, Ross. I'm very good. How are you, mate? I hope you managed to get a bit of oh. sleep. I probably look a bit ragged. <laughs> oh, no, you look, you, you look lovely as ever. <laughs> Hang on. I'll just... Um... I just had a message from Gary Nolan. I just want to double check what it is. So, my friend, how are you? Are you good? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to get into this. I'm kind of hopped up on caffeine for 11 o'clock at night. So I don't think I'm going to be sleeping because I've got to get this out and ready. <laughs> so I'm just uh, I'm just excited to be jumping in with this uh, with you, mate. Ready when you are, my friend. All right. Well, you have just been uh, you've been nonstop with this stuff, mate. Honestly, you never cease to impress me with the level of time and energy that you put towards this subject. Look, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I think we're at a really interesting and crucial point in the history of the coverage of this issue. Uh, as you know, I, I take a very um, firm view on, on the fact that as a, a mainstream media investigative journalist, I, I think this story is very, very important and needs to be covered properly. And um, the thing that amuses me, frankly, is that I think a lot of the mainstream media are only very, very slowly starting to realise the significance of some of the things that are being said by some very influential and um, well-informed people. And uh, frankly, um, uh, as long as I can hold that scoop myself as a journalist and keep on pursuing it for my own interests, I'm happy to do that. Because it's Frankly, I, I really do. I think this is probably unfolding and eventually will become known as probably one of the most, if not the most important story that that any journalist could ever cover. I mean, the, the implications behind what people like Lou Elizondo, Professor Gary Nolan, other people I'm talking to on background have told me are enormous. And I, I think that um, one of the issues here is that there's a disconnect a kind of a cognitive dissonance between the um, the reality that I'm aware of and the emerging truths that will probably soon become public knowledge from within the Congress um, and um, the way it's being covered uh, in what a lot of people pass for mainstream media. I mean, with the exception of shows like yours and the occasional stories that I do, um, the issue is not getting traction out there in the media, and it should be. No, you're absolutely right, and you know I can I can vouch for that as a UK citizen because it's still crickets over here. I've been saying it pretty much the entire time that this uh, discussion has been going on from the New York Times in 2017. But things are starting to ramp up, and there is an acceleration, and there's certainly been some. Uh, provocative statements made and some of them were made in your recent documentary so this was done for uh, seven news I thought you did an incredible job of navigating some pretty disruptive and controversial subjects and I think it's fair to say that the boat's been pushed a little bit further out with some of the statements made and some of the events covered in the documentary so for those that haven't seen it yet uh, what exactly was your intention with this investigation and what did you learn along the way? I intend this, like all my journalism, to be a way of briefing the lay audience. I mean, you're obviously part of a very specialised group of, of people on social media who, frankly, like I am, are across an enormous amount of detail that, frankly, for the general public is excessively confusing. The idea of all the films that I've made is to essentially brief people on the issue in a way that brings them up to speed with the basics, uh, to give them a basic primer on why this matters. And when you've got people of the gravitas and professional reputation of Professor Gary Nolan basically saying, as he has said to me, um, that he thinks that there is definitely an intelligence that is non-human behind what we're talking about here, that it's a reality, um, I think people slowly will start to sit up and take notice. Um, uh, this is why, I guess, in the story, I, I felt that it's journalistically dishonest. If you're talking about an intelligence, if you're talking about a technology, if you're talking about a consciousness and something that is advanced far beyond known human technology, displaying capabilities with perhaps craft that are doing things well beyond human understanding. Um, it's journalistically dishonest, I felt, to basically uh, not talk about the implications of that. Um, what if 
it turns out that all of these people who've been marginalized for years, including, I have to admit by myself, I've ignored the subject of abductees and a lot of people who claim to be experiences. There, there are some there are some experiences and some accounts that are just so off the wall, I don't know what to make of them. So for me, it's very, very interesting to, um, I think, bring our audience up to speed with the implications of what this all means. And I mean, we really are. I mean, I, I hope you agree with me. I think we're in an era now where when you have people even officials, public officials like Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, the czar, the intelligence czar for the United States, saying that one of the implications of what we now know is, <laughs> what was the word she used? Extraterrestriality or something. Um, you know, she used <laughs> the ET word. And yeah. that's coming from the person who's at the absolute apex of America's intelligence services. Yeah. And what I find bewildering, frankly, is national security correspondents on the New York Times, Washington Post, all of the major TV networks, PBS, you know, all of the big sort of megaphones, media megaphones in the United States. They're, they're holding back mm -hmm. from getting into this area because of the traditional stigma and ridicule that has been attached to the subject. But frankly, we're in a completely new era. We're in a, mm -hmm. a different period now where I think when you have officials of the gravitas of a Nolan or a Elizondo or, um, uh, you know, CIA officials, intelligence officials speaking publicly and implying very strongly that there is a genuine mystery here and that it does require engagement and investigation why why on earth not have a story which basically says well these are the implications of what this means yeah i mean well as you said uh, earlier the the gap of knowledge between the research community and the general public and even people within the mainstream media is is a phenomenal gap i mean there is so much to uh, pack in and incorporate with the subject itself so people are going to have to be acclimatized to this in a way that allows this kind of gradual uh, pace by pace acclimation. And I do think that we've certainly taken a step up. I mean, I was speaking to our friend Nick Cook the other day when he came on for an interview and we were discussing the same thing that initially when this first started with the New York Times, there was a lot of X-Files music. There was a lot of uh, you know, little green men and all that kind of stuff. And there's there's a level of seriousness that's now given to this subject within the mainstream media that although it's not at the level that we want to see it at, it's certainly been a, a noticeable progression. So I think that we're certainly entering into a period where this is being taken more seriously and more disruptive aspects of the conversation can start to be addressed. I mean, it's it's quite easy in a sense to talk about, you know, very strange drone-like platforms that are behaving in ways that we can't explain and they're maybe shadowing our navy carrier strike groups and it's all very national security and bureaucratic and kind of like oh okay i can understand that i can wrap my head around that it's a bit weird but there's something going on but once you incorporate you know abduction phenomenon and the kind of the caveats that come alongside that kind of uh, part of the subject it gets into an area that's not easy for people. So I think that you did a very good job of, of trying to discuss that in a way that maybe people will be a bit more receptive to. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I've got a lot of people, not a lot. I mean, there are a few debunker critics who are basically saying, you know, um, uh, you know, what, wh why are you even giving air to this subject matter? You know, um, and, um, you know, their peremptory dismissiveness is to say, ah, oh, you know, Jim's, Jim Marlin's sphere, it's probably just a, a metal ball. It's just a ball bearing. And it's funny. I mean, obviously, I've spent a fair bit of time ringing engineering shops trying to find a 50-pound ball bearing, and um, mm. <laughs> there aren't many, I can tell you. Can you, can, you explain, and, uh, can you explain Jim Marlin's story a little bit for people who okay, might Okay, well, know? Jim Marlin is a guy in Texas who I was put onto by a lovely bloke in Cambridge in your part of the world called Patrick Jackson. And uh, Patrick's a bloke who's long had a theory which – I guess requires investigation before I feel I can validate it in any way. 
But basically, um, Patrick has been observing for many years paranormal phenomena, what people might call ghosts, if you like, um, some kind of translucent uh, imagery or objects that come up on cameras uh, in haunted houses, you know, and a lot of people peremptorily dismiss such stuff. But one of the things he started realizing was that um, <laughs> there were spheres um, that that were associated with this phenomenon. And so he's developed a hypothesis, which is good science, that there is a link between metal spheres that traditionally go back to the Betts balls of the 1970s, which is metallic sphere, one of which was found by a family in Florida, um, uh, which appeared to manifest the capacity to move under its own power, rolling around the family home after it was found in a forest. And um, indeed, the um, uh, the sphere that was recovered by Jim Marlin in Texas uh, he actually found it or was given it from a, a by a friend of his in New Mexico. And the friend, um, interestingly enough, who happens to be Dennis Hopper, the film star's bodyguard, or at the time, 42 years ago, the friend basically told him that he and his then girlfriend or wife were sitting in the backyard of their remote house in the New Mexico mountains. And <laughs> the friend described literally this craft hovering over their house and dropping these metallic balls into what he assumes it thought was an empty valley. And um, the uh, the upshot is that when he arrived the following day, his friend said to him, look, <laughs> this is the story. You don't have to believe me. Uh, but, um, you know, this is what happened. And uh, you can have one if you like. And the interesting thing is the way uh, Jim tells us in the full story that he's told me, the um, the friend came running around days later trying to get the ball back because apparently the military were running around trying to get these balls and there was money being offered for the return of all of the spheres. And so he, um, he uh, has basically kept quiet about the fact that he's in possession of this sphere for 42 years. And he believes that it might be extraterrestrial technology. And I think it's important to at least investigate that. And what fascinates me is, I mean, obviously 99% of the messages that I'm getting are very supportive, but there's always those acid debunkers who come in and go, this can't possibly be true. You know, so for that reason, you shouldn't even be giving it any kind of airtime. And what are you doing as a journalist even considering this? And I think, if anything, what that demonstrates to me is scientific dogmatic, unscientific dogmaticism. Absolutely. absolutely. It demonstrates the very kind of behavior that is unscientific. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any scientist should consider possibilities. You know, essentially all good science is fundamentally based on observation and then deriving a hypothesis from that observation and testing that hypothesis. And one of the problems with the whole phenomena of UAPs is that it's untestable because it doesn't replicate. It doesn't allow experiments to be repeated. And here we have an opportunity where a gentleman is basically telling me uh, that um, he has a metallic sphere, which he believes is imbued with special properties. It may or may not be the case, but um you know, I think it's important to at least investigate. That. It, it, it must the be a great very, thing about uh, it. Is sorry, go on, please sorry. finish your sentence, please. No, the, the great thing about it is that Gary's prepared to um, investigate it. Gary Nolan, Professor Gary Nolan of Stanford University, is prepared to investigate it. And look, there's a there's quite a lot of background to the spheres. Um, Patrick is a phenomenally good researcher, and he's pointed out, as we noted in the story that quite often in UAP sightings, as well as the main purported craft, which is often a sort of a lenticular disc-shaped object, you often see these tiny little spheres just immediately adjacent to the object. And nobody's ever explained what they are or made much of the fact that they appear to be something. What Patrick's point is, is that he thinks that these spheres may be some kind of protection device, some kind of technology which is stopping these objects from interdicting and coming into our planet now i'm not humoring that necessarily as a as a theory until i've seen it tested but um we're doing a good job in basically taking 
uh, introducing a person who's had one of these objects for many years that he knows has not fallen into the hands of the US military and which is now under the care and control of an eminent scientist who can do the testing and reach a conclusion based on proper analysis. That's good science. And so, um, you know, we didn't say in the story that we necessarily believe that it is alien technology. One of the things that Gary floated with me is the possibility that maybe Jim himself is the receiver. Maybe he's mm. the person who's yeah. actually um, yeah. demonstrating capabilities. Uh, and it's funny, actually, when you're talking to a scientist of Gary's repute and hearing that kind of speculation from him, you kind of wonder, what is it that he knows? And this is the thing that I think um, a lot of people don't realize is that behind the scenes in the United States, there is a determined cohort of interested scientists who are now engaging with this phenomena. And Professor Gary Nolan is one of them. And full marks to him, all credit to him for being prepared to stick his head up above the parapet and suffer the slings and arrows of outraged debunkers. I was, uh, was going to jump into this a little bit later, but we might as well, since you touched on, uh, since you touched on Dr. Gary Nolan, um, I want to ask you a couple of things, because I, I want to talk to you about his opinion on the Admiral Wilson documents. But before we get into that specifically, I want, I want to ask you, um, given your interactions with Gary and also just taking into account what we already know about his public facing involvement in this, uh, in this push for more transparency on the UFO issue, how far into the fold do you feel Gary Nolan is when it comes to uh, like the, the primary network of influences of government behavior on the subject of UFOs? Because he speaks very confidently about there being a cover-up. He speaks very confidently about the internal opinion in government that this is not human. How close to the developing narrative of UFOs and how the government handles the subject do you feel Gary Nolan is? I know for a fact he's far closer than people realise. Uh, I mean, he's he's extremely uh, connected to, uh, obviously, Lua Elizondo, uh, Eric Davis, uh, Hal Putoff, uh, all of the people who are, if you like, the public face of efforts to um, make the public aware that there's a really interesting story here to be told behind this mystery. Um, but on his own admission, and this is something I explore with him in my interviews with him, which, uh, by the way, we'll be doing a much longer version of our uh, documentary as a, a, a podcast for Need to Know, the podcast I make with um, Bryce Zabel. We're, we're running in a vodcast audio and video, um, a very long, probably about 90-minute extended version of selected excerpts from interviews, including interviews with Gary Nolan that will be going up on the Need to Know vodcast uh, as a seven- news special uh, that goes into a lot of the detail that we're talking about here. And in that, I mean, as you've rightly noted, Gary makes the point that he believes that there is some kind of a non-human intelligence behind what we're talking about here. He categorically expresses the view that what we're talking about here is, um, this is this is an intelligence which may or may not be physical. He talks the, about the possibility that it could be some kind of consciousness, but it's certainly manifesting itself as an apparent technology, uh, physical objects that are being manifested in, in our um, atmosphere and indeed under our oceans and indeed in in orbit. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in his cautious scientific way, he's expressing the view that there is clearly an intelligence here. And I think that's astonishing. You know, when you basically start talking about the fact that there is a, a non-human intelligence that is capable of displaying what appears to be highly advanced technology, we're in a completely new paradigm. We are. We are in a completely new paradigm. And I think one of the primary catalysts, at least one that I hope to see being a primary catalyst, will be the discussion of what's already been retrieved, recovered, re-engineered in the Black programs. Because we, this is something that's kind of leading on from Gary Nolan, because we know that it was uh, Dr. Gary Nolan who briefed Congressman Mike Gallagher on the Admiral Wilson documents prior to the Congressman yep. leading the uh, 
the congressional hearing on unidentified aerial phenomena where he questioned two Pentagon officials and what the US government knows. According to their very brief and restricted review of the situation, they were asked by Mike Gallagher if they were aware of the Admiral Wilson leaks or the Eric Davis notes. Uh, they, they denied any knowledge of them. Uh, but I felt for some time now that the Admiral Wilson leaks are a strategic card that is being played or is going to be played at the right time. And that this group of shakers and movers, Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, Dr. Gary Nolan, you know, and, and others obviously in the process in the background, um, are moving this card into the playing field. The fact that Gary Nolan used his opportunity to provide a line of questioning for Congressman Mike Gallagher, and he chose the Wilson documents, should speak volumes to their legitimacy. Here we have a world-renowned Stanford scientist, highly respected in his field and highly connected to those within government who are moving the UFO disclosure ball down the field. And he chooses this series of leaked documents as the most vital thing for Mike Gallagher to question these officials on. And then he even told us that he briefed Gallagher during his interview with Tucker Carlson. So my question to you, Ross, is do you believe that the Admiral Wilson documents are a strategic card that's going to be played? And is this why Gary Nolan is being so publicly vocal about them? It's not a question of belief, it's knowledge. I know for a fact that the Admiral Wilson document is absolutely integral to what is hopefully soon to unfold, at least in private hearings in the Congress. I mean, let's, let's explain to your listeners and viewers what we're talking about here. The implications of the Admiral Wilson document are that there is a an apparent transcript or at least a memo that records an alleged conversation between astrophysicist Dr. Eric Davis and Admiral Tom Wilson in, I think, 2002, ironically, in a car park outside the offices of EG&G, the notorious Area 51 logistics firm in Las Vegas. And it should be emphasized right from the head that Admiral Tom Wilson, the former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, categorically denies that any such conversation took place or that he has ever made any such statements. So with that in mind, let's proceed to what the document actually says. The document purports to be a record, a very detailed record of a conversation that took place between Davis and Wilson. Um, where Wilson basically described the efforts that he had made to try to investigate claims that were put to him by Dr. Stephen Greer in a meeting in 1997, where Greer basically revealed to him, allegedly, code names that he was not familiar with, that when he investigated those code names inside the Pentagon, Admiral Tom Wilson purportedly discovered a covert, hidden, UFO, UAP crash retrieval program that was concealed inside very secure secret special access programs uh, that were hidden in a specific part of um, an office inside the Pentagon. And what it described essentially was that the United States had allegedly recovered craft, alien technology, and that moreover, that alien technology had been deliberately withheld from the purview of Congress and various oversight bodies by concealing it inside private aerospace, inside a private aerospace company. And what the document purported to record was Admiral Wilson's frustrations at when he discovered the existence of this project, the obdurate resistance by that private aerospace company in allowing him to find out anything about the program and uh, his eventual discovery and admissions from the aerospace company that, yes, they did have alien technology, that it was concealed and that he was not to talk about it, and moreover, that he was told to shut up about it by his superiors in the Defence Intelligence Agency. Now, it's one hell of a conspiracy, and I've never known quite what to make of the Admiral Wilson document because... Um, you know, there are some people who say, including Admiral Wilson, that it's a hoax, that it's not true, that it doesn't record accurate events. Um, but one thing I'm very, very sure of is that the provenance of the document is very clear in my book. I know for a fact that it came from the estate of Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 lunar module pilot, 
and that Edgar Mitchell was probably sent it by either Eric Davis or Dr. Hal Putoff shortly after the conversation allegedly occurred. And what interested me in the interview that I did with Professor Gary Nolan a few weeks ago is when I asked Gary Nolan about the Admiral Wilson document, it was very much in the context of the, the general claim pushed indeed in part by people like Lou Elizondo, the former head of the Pentagon's UFO program, that that there, there was retrieved technology of some kind, or as, you, as Lou refers to it, exotic material. Other people have been more frank. But basically, in the context of that conversation, I then went for it and decided to ask Professor Gary Nolan, um, does he know anything about the Admiral Wilson document? And he said, yes. I asked him, does he think it's genuine? And he said, yes. Uh, he said, I know Eric Davis, and Eric is of a kind of character, it's impossible for him to lie. And then I explained the significance of that document, which is that Tom Wilson, the Admiral, allegedly had a conversation with Eric Davis, where he imparted his discovery that was allegedly a secret UFO <laughs> reverse engineering program going on inside either the US government or private corporate aerospace where they were hiding allegedly a recovered spacecraft. It was being hidden supposedly inside private aerospace, according to the memo, in a private aerospace corporation. And I put it to Gary. I said, look, Gary, the journo in me, the journalist in me, thinks it's highly implausible for the simple fact that in America, everything leaks. You know, it's impossible to keep a secret like that. And Gary went, well, this is an example of it leaking. And, uh, you know, he made the point that, yes, the memo had eventually come to public awareness. And I, I, I said, OK, but, but how sure are you of the provenance of the memo and, and what the implications are of what's inside it? And he basically told me that he, he's known about the memo for many, many years before it even became public. And he's aware of the conversations. And without naming names, he satisfied himself that he believes that it's a genuine document and that it records an, an accurate account of events. And um, he said to me, crucially, well before this came to light, I already knew of the document because Eric was part of a group that I was associated with around this. And I respond to him uh, and I say, the implications of that are mind blowing, Gary. And he goes, yeah, yeah. In this conversation, you've told me that you believe on evidence that there is non-human intelligence of advanced technology on this planet. And he goes, right, advanced capabilities. Now, I don't know whether it's a technology per se, because I'm leaving open the idea that it's some form of consciousness that is non-material. I might say to my colleagues out there, I know this all sounds completely crazy, absolutely crazy, but if you've seen the things that I've seen, you would only be able to come to a similar conclusion. Wow. I know, again, my reputation takes a hit. I'm sure there are prizes and other things that I'm never going to get because I'm talking about this. That's nowhere near as important as the subject matter to me. And I say to him, I put it to him, I say the best science is when you go against the grain. And he cites Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he says, well, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Eventually, the anomalies and the things that don't fit the picture add up to the point where you can't ignore it anymore. That's what has just recently happened. We're looking, we're watching a Kuhnian moment. Now, Gary's very cautious. He's obviously not going to name names and say who he's spoken to or who's imparted the information to him. But when you have a Nobel nominee, Stanford professor, with his incredible pedigree, basically saying that, I think we all need to start sitting up and noticing and, and listening. At what stage do we stick our head in the sand as mainstream media and basically say, oh, this can't possibly be true to, because it's too confronting and because the Sydney Morning Herald or the New York Times or the, the, um, the Washington Post hasn't said it yet? 
the reality is that the mainstream media is way behind the eight ball on this issue. And it's only slowly going to wake up, I think, when hearings start on the hill. And believe me, I know for a fact, this is independent of any conversation I've had with Gary, I know for a fact that those hearings are going to very soon start on the hill and they are going to be momentous. Momentous is a big word. Is there anything you can mm. expand on there or is that is that all we get? No. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Uh, I mean, basically, I've 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 been spoken to by people who've given me an indication. I mean, Gary, uh, I think refers obliquely to it in the sense that he, he's aware of what's coming. He knows what's coming, that there are whistleblowers, and that there are whistleblowers who are about and prepared to give evidence. And without wanting to jeopardise those whistleblowers or in any way imperil the possibilities of those people being able to get before the Congress and give evidence under oath, I think we should leave it at that. That basically, yes, there yeah, are yeah. going to be people who are going to be giving evidence before the Congress. And if their evidence is heard, even if it's heard in private hearing, it won't take long for it to leak because the implications of what they're going to be saying will be so momentous that I think the public will want to hear about it. I hope people are really uh, paying close attention to what Ross is saying here. Do you think the public would be surprised at the level of movement going on in the background right now in terms of people who are gearing up to bring things out of the shadows? I was. I mean, one of the things that I've been pleasantly surprised about is, as you know, in the course of the research that I did for my book, In Plain Sight, mm -hmm. I was um, talking to people who purported to be aware of the program who purported to be aware of a crash retrieval program inside the US government, or indeed, more likely, inside private aerospace, because a lot of these people that I've spoken to do work in a private aerospace capacity for private defense companies. And to be honest with you, Jay, I've never, I think, I think I've said to you before, I, I would never believe 100% any of this until I've kicked the tire of the TR3B, you know. I think, I, I, think the, I said to you, they don't have tires. <laughs> <laughs> I bloody well hope not. I'm sure they're more advanced. But uh, the, the interesting thing is I've never quite known whether to believe what I was being told because there's always that risk that there's a disinformation program. Maybe what this is is an effort, I always felt, an effort by America to try and impress on its potential adversaries. Don't screw with us. You know, we know Russia's causing trouble in the Ukraine. We know China's causing trouble with Taiwan. So don't screw with us. We've got things up our sleeve um, that you need to be aware of, but we don't want to reveal just yet. It, it struck me that maybe this was clever disinformation. I no longer think that the case. I, I actually do think that there are people and some of the people who are talking about coming forward and approaching Congress and giving evidence are some of the people that I've spoken to. and. If they do, the world is about to start getting very, very interesting. Things are going to happen very, very quickly. That's what I'm excited about. Um, I don't want to put a spanner in the works by um, getting overexcited. I'm a little bit worried that some crazy loon inside the Pentagon might take us into a war with China before this gets an opportunity to be put before the, the House and heard in Congress. Um I'm, I'm really worried about the degree of fragmentation in American society right now. I think it's a very dangerous time for the United States and the degree of polarization in politics is actually quite alarming. And I guess if this turns out to be true, if, if as Gary is telling me, there is non-human intelligence of advanced technology on this planet of some kind, if that's true, maybe this is something that can bring societies together. Maybe it can help us overcome the differences that we have. Maybe it'll make people wake up and realize the awesome portent and significance of what we're talking about here and make them forget their differences. Um, I can only be optimistic, but I, I guess what I'm anxious to do is nothing that in any way confounds or complicates the process of getting these people before the Congress to give evidence, because I know 
there are people who are talking about giving evidence who I know are in conversation with congressional staffers. I know the names of those congressional staffers. I know who they're talking to. And I know that these engagements are happening. And I know that reach outs are occurring where people are being invited to give evidence. And crucially, as our good friend Douglas Johnson has highlighted in his excellent analyses of the proposed legislation, there is legislation that is before the um, the House, some of it's already passed the House of Reps, which will eventually go to the Senate for final approval. And if, if it goes through into the appropriations legislation for 2023, there will be the most formidable barrage of laws to allow people to give evidence, to protect them against persecution, which, um, if they are enacted, uh, would ease the way for people to speak. Now, I, I had thought that this might not happen until 2023, but uh, I'm told that at least some hearings will be happening this year. Uh, I don't know whether the momentous witnesses that I'm talking about will be giving evidence um, this year or early next, but I know it's coming. And I sincerely hope there's nothing put in its way to stop it from happening. And what I'm really heartened by is from talking to people in the US, both on and off the record, um, there is a new resolve. There is an absolute certainty now that witnesses are going to be given the opportunity. And, and there is a, a one-off opportunity now to basically get these people to come forward and give evidence about what they know. And it's absolutely crucial that people, frankly, if, if people are asking what they, what can they do, uh, especially people in the United States, they can impress upon their congressional representative and their senator that to them, this is absolutely fundamentally important in helping them decide their vote, especially in the midterms. Um, because the resolve, certainly in the legislation to date, is bipartisan. You know, there's been often without a role, without a count, you know, there's been a unanimous support for the preliminary drafts of the legislation that have gone through the House of Reps, um, particularly, you know, legislation designed to protect people who come forward. But the, um, you know, it's really important. I, I cannot emphasize more. This is about democracy. This is about the Congress asking questions, bringing people for, before public hearings under oath, it's very, very important that people flag to their congressional representatives and their senators that to, to them as voters, to you out there as voters who are in a position to be able to influence the outcome of both the midterms and the next American election. This is a, an issue that you care about because what has traditionally happened uh, it has been that fundamentally, you know, the, the military, the Pentagon has been a very powerful lobby on the Hill. And there are forces in the Pentagon and in private aerospace in particular that do not want this issue to come forward. And uh, I think people need to rattle the cage. They need to make it very, very clear that they want these questions asked. And if this is, if, say, it turns out this is American black technology and it's not some form of higher intelligence at all. I would be the first one to be delighted about that because it means that the United States is almost certainly in possession of technology that we're not even aware of yet. And I couldn't think of a better country in the world to have control of this technology. I'd rather it than authoritarian regimes like the Russians and the Chinese. Um, but if the potential is that people are going to be talking about a technology that is recovered non-human technology, alien spacecraft, if that really is the case, if that really is the case, then we are about to enter into a revolution in world, world affairs. It's the biggest story of all time. We, we are just, we are in such an incredible time uh, in the human story, Ross. I mean, you know, what the fuck is going on? There's just so much going on in the world. It's it's it, it, on both the positive and the negative scale. There's, it's just a absolutely bubbling, boiling pot of stuff just going on on this planet right now. And on top of all of this is the UFO subject just 
being this dazzling kind of example of something completely new, completely different to this boring, repetitive system we've been in place for, for, for so long and maybe for too long. And maybe this is actually a whole natural part of a system breaking down and we're entering into something very strange, very new and pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm excited too. I mean, I think that the potential for this to be uh, an absolutely massive story um, is really only months away. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I, I think your audience need to understand is they might be wondering, well, why, why isn't the New York Times editorializing about this? You know, why isn't this in the Washington Post or on CBS, Fox, ABC, NBC? Well, funnily enough, it is actually on Fox. It's just being marginalized because it's Tucker Carlson who, um, people don't like a lot of people, uh, but full marks to Tucker for actually taking this on as a as a legitimate journalistic issue, and you know, and there are isolated pockets. There's Tom Rogan, um, mm -hmm. there's uh, Brian Bender on Politico. You know, there are a few people who need to be um, acknowledged and and welcomed. Uh, there's George Knapp, of course, um, and uh, you know, there are people in mainstream media who are who are um, jousting at the windmill, basically trying to get this issue paid attention to. But one of the problems that I don't think people realize is that, and I saw this a lot as a journalist myself, covering national security and defense issues. As a national security defense reporter, you're only as good as the sources that you can cultivate. And if you're writing something that pisses the defense department off, you get marginalized, you get cut off. And so you learn pretty quickly not to report certain things. And one of the issues that you get marginalized on is if you start reporting on UAPs, UFOs. It's certainly the case in my country. I mean, uh, you know, I'm already getting blowback, funnily enough, from sections of the mainstream media who think that I'm crazy for covering the issue. And they've got no idea. They have absolutely no awareness of the implications, even of what the Pentagon has formally acknowledged since June last year. That this is an authentic mystery. Yeah. You know, we're not saying it's little green men from Zeta Reticuli, but what we are saying is that the Pentagon, in its June report last year, formally acknowledged that out of 144 incidents, they could explain only one of them, and there are 143 incidents that they've been involved in investigating, and it's now, as Moultrie and Bray told the Congress only a couple of months ago, there are now hundreds more unexplained incidents involving phenomena that the United States government, despite all of its best technology, is incapable of explaining. Phenomena doing the five observables in many cases, instantaneous velocity, hypersonic speeds, transmedium travel, stealth mode, and perhaps most alarmingly of all, some kind of positive lift, antigravitics possibly. The implications of that as a technology are mind-blowing. And frankly, the fact that um, national security and defense correspondents aren't writing about it shouldn't deter people from taking it seriously. They're just catching up with the rest of us. It, it's funny, you know, because um, <laughs> somebody said to me uh, late last night um, after the program went to air, they, um, they said, oh, you know, there's a couple of people basically um, having a go at you, you know, attacking your credibility and suggesting that as a journalist, you're just trying to sort of boost your book and make money out of it. Believe me, my friend, if I wanted to make money, I would stay away from this issue. You know, it, it's, it's journalistic poison in terms of being taken seriously by your peers and in terms of getting commissions as a journalist to, to do other stories. Um, and in terms of selling books, I don't sell a lot of books. The, the reality is that, um, uh, there's more plundered copies of my books out there as bootlegs on the on the uh, on the open internet than uh, I can publish myself. Uh, and uh, if I tried to make a living out of um, selling books, I'd be a very poor man indeed. I have to supplement my income by doing the journalism that I do in addition to the work that I do on UAPs, um, which is why I work for the Seven Network in Australia. And can I just say, you know. Um, even though I'm not entirely comfortable at times with the way they sensationalize in their promos, because I thought the promos for our story were a tad over the top at times. Um, I do think that uh, it's to be applauded that a mainstream media organization has embraced this issue. Um, and they're ahead of their time. 
You know, it's it's very interesting to me that a TV network has recognized that this is a legitimate story. And in order for them to do that, I've had to sit down with them and say, look, you know, you don't need to be frightened of engaging with this subject matter because the Pentagon has acknowledged that UAPs are an authentic mystery. Exactly. Uh, basically, there are people at a very high level in US intelligence and the defense forces acknowledging that this is a reality. And frankly, when you've got, as you would have just seen with what I put to air with Gary Nolan, when you've got scientists with the connections that, for example, Gary Nolan has, I mean, he's worked for and is still working with the CIA doing investigations into people who've been exposed to unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, you know, they regard him as sufficiently informed on, on the areas that they're interested to examine to, to retain him for the purposes of investigating pilots and um, military personnel who've been exposed to anomalous phenomena. And full marks to the US government for doing that kind of work and for commissioning it. And so essentially what's happening at the moment, I find it quite hilarious, is that while a large part, in fact, the bulk of the mainstream media is just watching this par passing caravan rolling by, um, they're missing the point. This is the story of the moment, and it's going to eventually, I think eventually, it will probably take a hearing on the Hill where a key witness basically says for the first time, let's hypothetically say they talk about a crash retrieval program, and let's hypothetically say they say, oh, you know, Lockheed Martin's been hiding something in a cupboard for the last 50 years. Let's, let's hypothetically assume that that's the case. Um, if that was to be said in a private hearing on the Hill. Gosh, don't you think that would leak, Jay? And don't you think the major newspapers would then start embracing this story and claiming it as their own? There will come a time, I think, when the story will achieve momentum. But just now for the moment, it's just you and me. So let those crazy people who are debunking this issue, let, just, let them spew their hot air and get on with what they're doing for their living. And uh, let's just politely ignore them. We don't have to credit them. We don't have to acknowledge them. They're irrelevant, basically, to the issue. They've been overtaken by events. I frankly don't care what they think, and I don't think people should either. I'm actually fascinated and puzzled as to why, without naming names, some debunkers, not skeptics, I admire skeptics, but there are some debunkers who get, I think, an inordinate amount of coverage because they just put up a ridiculous explanation for the phenomenon, which is frankly nonsensical, but which everybody feels the obligation to at least respond to. And I don't know why we bother. You know, the bottom line is there is an anomalous phenomena that the Pentagon admits is real. Um, it's a technology of some kind. It's intelligent. And people like Gary Nolan are saying it's intelligent. It's an intelligence. It's possibly a consciousness of some kind. Now, whatever the hell it is, all we're saying is it needs to be investigated. Why is that so difficult? And why is that so confronting for people? And why are they so hostile to that idea? That's the thing I find fascinating. We're now in a stage where, as Michio Kaku has said, the people who purport to speak for science are being very unscientific. Because good science embraces new ideas. As Gary cited, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, pays tribute to the scientists who had the courage to think against the grain. One of my heroes in Australia is the guy who was an Australian scientist who recognised that contrary to what people thought, for many, many years, ulcers, stomach ulcers, weren't caused by stress. And to demonstrate the point that he was making, he drank a beaker of stomach ulcer bacteria and proved that essentially it was a bacterial infection. And that revolutionized scientific understanding of stomach ulcers. That was a scientist who had the courage to go against the grain. And somebody like Professor Gary Nolan, who is not a Nobel nominee for no reason, is somebody who has the courage to go against the grain. Um, there are other scientists, by the way, who I'm speaking to who are uh, watching and waiting for the opportunity to speak about what they know and what they think, and they will eventually emerge. There's a, the thing that I, I've come back from the States excited about, 
is that there is now, in my view, a momentum here, which is enormous. And yes, there are forces in the Pentagon and in private aerospace who want to slow this down, and in fact, to stop it. They're using feeble excuses inside the Pentagon that, you know, the world's too busy right now with the distractions of Ukraine and the possibility of war with China over the Taiwan situation. And they're basically trying to argue that, you know, these things should be put in a back in a box for another few decades. Ain't going to happen, guys. Well, this is something I wanted to quickly ask. Do you get any sort of impression as to who has more influence uh, in decision making with this subject, the people who are trying to prevent it from occurring or the people that are starting to try and steamroll this into the light? Um, on the Hill, in the Congress and the Senate, the numbers are with those in favour of disclosure. And the reason why is for simple political reasons. Politicians like Warner, Rubio, even our mutual friend Tim Burchett, they see votes in the fact mm -hmm. that the public is into this issue. There's a great term, I think I've cited it to you before, called the wisdom of the crowd, where pollsters often talk about how there are perturbations in public opinion that are reflected often in social media, but not reflected in polling. And there is a perturbation occurring um, in, in space-time right now, which is public opinion is, tur is turning right now. You know, people are plugging in. The politicians are aware. They are getting letters. They're getting phone calls. They're getting emails. People are letting them know that this matters. And by golly, it really does matter when people write in, make the effort to put a, a letter together put a stamp on an envelope and send a letter into your senator, your congressional representative, and say that this matters to you. They're listening. So the question isn't really who has the power in the Pentagon or the intelligence services or in private corporate aerospace. Those people are irrelevant because people like that seem to have forgotten that America is enshrined in constitutional law. It's government by the people for the people. And this is an incredibly historic moment. It's actually quite exciting. I mean, I'm a lawyer by training. And the thing that I love about America, the thing I've always admired, is it's rooted in constitutional rights. And some of the greatest moments in American history have happened when the constitutional rights of Americans have been stood up for. I'm just looking on my shelf for my copy of the Iran-Contra folder. I, I was such a, um, a fan of the Watergate hearings and the Iran-Contra hearings in the um, 1970s and then later on in the 1980s when Iran-Contra hearings happened. And that was essentially the Congress basically saying, you know what? We're sick of the bullshit and the lies and the cover-ups. We're going to expose this. And believe me, mate, that's what's going to happen with UAPs. Whatever the secrets are, that are being concealed, they are going to be disclosed and revealed in first private and then eventually public congressional hearings. We are going into an extremely interesting period in American history where a paradigm that has been ridiculed, stigmatized, and often mocked by mainstream media, opinion leaders, politicians, the Pentagon, the intelligence community for much of the last 75 years is about to be disclosed in a way that I don't think people are even ready for. But imagine if in hearings on the Hill, witnesses start giving evidence about crash retrieval programs. I think that the, um, <laughs> honestly, I'm just kind of sitting here and I've got all of these different questions written down and different paragraphs written down for things and I, I'm just kind of in a little bit of a state of shock because I, you know this is such a this is such a historic moment um and the the level of coverage it's getting is kind of weird because obviously it's just not happening the way people ever anticipated where every sci-fi film in the world you know when the aliens are arriving or things are being talked about it's the world news all over and that hasn't happened because there's just such a domination of the 24 hour news cycle by different things. But this, yeah. this could, I mean, the way that you're talking about it, it just, it just makes me feel like this could be something where when I recap with you in 2023, we're having a completely different conversation. Yeah. 
And I think we will be. I really do. I think we will be. I mean, uh, unless some fuckwit in the Pentagon pushes a button and starts a war with China, this yeah, is going to um, this is going to you know that's this is going to come out. I mean, essentially, there will be Watergate-style public hearings on the Hill. Witnesses are going to give evidence. Um, and that's the thing I've come back with more certain than I was before, because I was getting very concerned uh, earlier in the year that, that you know, the, the forces that are trying to sit on this issue were going to suppress it successfully and, and basically stop hearings from happening. And, and the turning point for me was when um, the, the proposed legislation uh, that's going to be put into the defence 2023 defence appropriations was put before both the House of Reps and and is now sort of coming up before the Senate for consideration, and this has come from the two key committees that the House and Senate Intelligence and Armed Services Committees. Um, these are two of the most powerful committees regulating the. The, uh, the intelligence services and the defence department. Basically, it's being made very, very clear to the military that they're not going to get any money next financial year unless they, they start being more open. And the thing that I was really struck by from talking to mainly staffers, but also a couple of politicians in the Congress, including Tim Burchett, is there is not just a frustration, but a palpable anger that they've been having their chain pulled by mm -hmm. the Pentagon and the intelligence community for so many years. And they're pissed off. They know they've been lied to. And the reason they know they've been lied to is because what people miss is there's already been secret hearings on the Hill. You know, there've been hearings inside SCIFs where politicians, and I've spoken to some of them, have seen the videos. That are, that are so profoundly important to making them realize that this is a real phenomena. And, um, uh, you know, there, there have already been witnesses give evidence on the Hill uh, about issues. And so I can tell you, I mean, I know for a fact, because some of the people that I talk to are already getting phone calls, there is a very aggressive cohort of staffers who can see that there is a fantastic story behind all of this. And one of the dreams you have as a staffer on the Hill is the power that the Congress can derive from a bipartisan push for an investigation where witnesses are deposed under oath and basically compelled to give evidence about what they know. That's what's going to happen. You uh, you highlighted the uh, the infamous Roswell event in the documentary, and uh, as many of us know, there's now, as you were saying, this new legislation uh, which does include a sweeping review of all UFO related data going back to January of 1947, with Roswell being in January of 19 uh, sorry July of 1947. Uh, this means that the Roswell event does fall under the review parameters. But I'm wondering, uh, you know, do you think that something like Roswell would ever come to light uh, through any sort of legislative change, or is that just too either too secret, sensitive, or just too old and buried away and squirreled away? Uh, if there's been a cover up about an alien landing or a craft of some kind being landed and retrieved by the US military or some kind of private or aerospace recovery, if there has been a cover-up, whether it be Roswell, Aztec, Chihuahua, or mm. you know any such event, um, I'm reasonably confident that it will be brought to light, if that's the case. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I see no uh, lack of resolve in the Congress. Uh, there is a real desire to get to the truth of this matter. I mean, that legislation, I mean, there wasn't even a show of hands. It was just accepted. Yeah. It was a bipartisan yeah. decision by the Congress uh, in the House of Reps to basically pass the, um, the, the section that's already gone through the House of Reps, which is, I think, a, it's kind of a secure um, – protection system, you know, to make sure that people can come forward. Uh, and it guarantees protection against persecution if you if you are prepared to give evidence about UAP, UFO information. But it's part of a broader sweep of legislation that, as we both know, is still before the House of Reps and the Senate. And frankly, unless there's some 
incredible blowback from forces in the Pentagon or the intelligence service, uh, I think it'll happen. And and this is all credit, frankly, to people like Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo. One of the reasons Lou stepped back from the very public uh, speaking role is because, believe me, he's he's down there on the hill or up there on the hill behind the scenes, pressing the flesh and, and pushing people to actually sit up and take notice of this issue. There's a phenomenal amount of work being done by both Elizondo and Mellon and others to get this issue into the forefront of concern in the Congress. And believe me, um, congressional representatives and senators are listening. I mean, I know, for example, Senator Gillibrand hasn't been taking a very public position recently, but she's aware that there are votes in this issue. And let's be brutally honest about it. What drives congressional representatives and senators to do anything about yeah, anything? Exactly. It's votes. And I think the writing is on the wall here. Um, this is why um, it's so incredibly important that this issue does keep on being pushed by people individually writing letters. Don't just send emails, write letters. There's a formidable amount of power in flooding a senator or congressional representative's office with letters saying, dear sir, madam, I care about this issue. I want UAPs investigated. I don't think it's rubbish. I think it's a serious issue that is worthy of serious investigation and engagement by your office. Please represent me as my congressional member and do something about this. They're listening and they're aware that people are asking questions about it. And, you know, there's um, uh, you've got uh, Fox doing the uh, Tucker Carlson series. Mm -hmm. You've got Tucker racing it on his evening show. You've got CNN doing a, I think it's a six part TV series that's coming. I'm aware of your British Sky TV is doing a major series. I've been asked. To in the early stages to get involved in that. Good. There is the beginning of an awakeness mm -hmm. by certainly some media to actually start taking this seri issue seriously. And to, um, you know, to some degree, the, uh, the mainstream media in my country is starting to wake up. Late last night, I, I had a phone call from somebody in the Australian Air Force who I would never, never in a, a moment have thought they would reach out to me and ring me. But they really encouraged me to keep on pushing. And what's interesting is that at the moment in my country, in Australia, there is this kind of head in the sand attitude. We, our Defence Department, has um, glibly followed America into wars for the past um, 100 years. And, and, you know, we're not, not about to stop now. Basically, we're... Um, you know, we, we just do what America says. And I think they're waiting for their instructions from Washington, D.C. about what to do about this annoying I, Ross I, Coulthard I think guy we, who's <laughs> asking questions. <laughs> yeah, I think we share a similar culture in that regard when it comes to uh, our respective countries and how they are handling this but, issue. You know, it's, it's really interesting, though, Jay. I mean, one of the things that I mean, a lot of people, there's a bit of a whispering campaign, for example, going on at the moment about the Condine photograph that, mm. that I think still is a very important photograph. Condine Some, or Calvine? Calvine. Oh, sorry, Calvine. Sorry, yeah, my yeah. apologies. Calvine photograph. The I'm talking here about an image that was given publicity in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. that was released by Dr. David Clark. Um, great bit of research. And um, there's already a bit of a blowback. I've heard a whispering uh, from the United States in particular that suggests that claims that this might be uh, American prototype technology are nonsense and that uh, it was just a hoax and that it's just a rock in a lake or something and that we should just all dismiss this. And there's a very clever disinformation whispering campaign coming back against that image. Um, I just want to flag here, people need to keep the pressure up on that image. The, the, the real story is not out yet. And uh, I, I'm not satisfied that it's a hoax. And uh, I think there are good reasons for why it does need to be taken seriously. And I do think that the United States has been deceitful, probably even with its British ally, about what it knows about that issue. And um, one of the issues here is that on that issue, the Calvine issue, but more broadly on the broader implications of what, for example, Professor Gary Nolan is talking about in his interview with me, the possibility that there is some kind of 
intelligence, with technology engaging with this planet. I'm in no doubt whatsoever that the United States is lying through its teeth. I mean, we ran deliberately on the documentary last night a quote that President Clinton gave when he visited Ireland, where he assured a little boy in Ireland who'd written to him that there was no truth to the Roswell story and that, in fact, um, Roswell did not involve the recovery of an alien spacecraft. Now, if I was Bill Clinton, I wouldn't be so sure about that. And people need to ask, why is it that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, particularly Hillary, were mm -hmm. at the forefront yes. in terms yes. of private discussions about the potential for disclosure if and when Hillary Clinton became president in 2017. What was going on? And again, you know, this is the thing that just, I mean, you and I have spoken about this so many times. This is the thing that frustrates me is that for all his faults, Julian Assange's WikiLeaks brought out the most extraordinary story because they were leaked by the GRU mm -hmm. emails from the Democratic National Committee, which basically showed that there were discussions happening between Hillary Clinton's principal advisor, John Podesta, two senior Pentagon generals recently retired, and people like Robert Weiss from Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. um, which basically uh, suggested that there was intentions if Hillary became president for some kind of disclosure of something pertaining to UFOs, UAPs. And, and in all uh, of the and analysis, Edgar, Mitchell, maybe, Edgar Mitchell was in the mix there as well. He was. And in all of the analysis or the lack of analysis by mainstream American media, maybe it's just too hard for them. I thought I'd spell it out in my book, and I thought you'd spell it out pretty well in your podcasts. The, the simple fact is people are missing the significance of what has already come. And, you know, you and I are impatient for the full story to, to roll out. But I do think it's going to emerge that presidents have been willfully deceived or some presidents. And the implications of that are momentous. Imagine if it comes out in the, in the Congress. Imagine if, say, Hillary Clinton's called, or Bill Clinton's called, and Bill's asked to explain what he was told as president that made him believe that Roswell was a, a furphy, as we say in Australia, a nonsense story about a retrieved alien spacecraft. Imagine if it turns out that and I'm not saying it is necessarily, but imagine if it turns out that Roswell was a retrieved alien spacecraft. Imagine if it turns out that Roswell was real. Or imagine if it turns out that Roswell was one of a succession of crash retrievals that happened throughout the 1940s and the 1950s. And imagine if it turns out that whatever those craft are or whatever they represent, there's some kind of technology. And in an effort to evade accountability and oversight, there was a conspiracy between sections of the Pentagon and the intelligence community to essentially withhold this from oversight and, and the purview of Congress by removing it to private corporate aerospace. And imagine if that's where it stagnated for the past 70 something years. Imagine if that was the case. Wouldn't the Congress be legitimately angry that perhaps crimes have been committed? I mean, the only way that I think if this is true, that it could be not a crime is if some president at some time in previous history has signed an executive order that actually says that this should be kept secret from all future presidents unless there's some good reason to do so. But could that possibly be constitutionally legal? What if Bill Clinton gave evidence before the Congress that he did ask and was lied to? You know, I mean, the, the implications of this are extraordinary. And I think this is why... Um, Sunlight is a great disinfectant. It's a great way of bringing this stuff out into the open. But it's also why, frankly, I think it's important that there be some kind, even though I frankly would love to see the people responsible for any cover-up, tarred, feathered, and dragged behind a Humvee and publicly excoriated, I can accept that there's a need for these people to basically be given some kind of legal protection to come forward. And, and maybe they feel they were doing the honourable thing and that the, the basically it was important for this to be um, uh, uh, protected from foreign adversaries during the Cold War. But either way, if 
if there has been some kind of massive cover-up of retrieved non-human technology, which frankly, let's be honest about it, is what people like Lou Elizondo and others like Eric Davis are talking about, then if there's been that kind of cover-up, potentially crimes have been committed and it will only take congressional hearings, public congressional hearings for the full story to come to light. But I can imagine that that would be the case uh, sorry, if that was the case, it would come to light fairly quickly if there were public hearings. And that, that's that's the exciting thing that we're talking about here, that, um, you know, if there is a concealed a cover-up like that, then um, it needs to be brought out. Because, you know, <laughs> let's, let's just go through it a priori, all of the assumptions that are being made here. We know for a fact that there is a phenomenon that is doing anomalous things that are not within known human science. There are apparently intelligently controlled objects, some people say craft, that are displaying what some call the five observables. They're doing hypersonic speeds, instantaneous velocity, transmedium travel, they're displaying stealth mode, and they're showing positive lift. I mean, the purported Calvine UFO from the early 1990s appeared to be hovering in position, according to the witnesses. How does a gigantic object like that hover in position without any audible jet propulsion or rocket propulsion to hold it in place? Um, what is the technology that lies behind that and all of the other phenomena that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of witnesses have seen all around the world for the past at least since the Second World War and further. Um, why is it that there's been a deliberate, if there's nothing to this, why has there been a very deliberate campaign since at least the Robertson panel, driven by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, to discredit and stigmatise people who speak publicly about the phenomenon? Why, why was it felt, if this is all rubbish, why was it felt important to stigmatize and ridicule it and mock it? Does the media realize that it's been led by the nose into treating the subject with, I think, over excessive skepticism, that it's been discouraged from looking into dark places and asking questions? Frankly, it didn't take much really for me as an investigative journalist to find myself talking to people who purport to have knowledge of a crash retrieval program inside the US government. Now, I can't say for sure that I know that that's true because there's always the possibility of disinformation. But if it is disinformation, if it turns out that it's not non-human technology, the only other explanation is that someone on this planet, possibly human, has this technology. Someone's got this ability. There is a technology out there that is displaying, for example, anti-gravity, positive lift, hypersonic speeds, instantaneous velocity, stealth mode, transmedium mode. This is something that is incredibly exciting. It implies that someone somewhere has developed room temperature superconductors, the ability to store incredible amounts of energy and instantaneously deploy those massive amounts of energy in a way that as yet has not been explained by modern physics. And everybody should be excited about that because the implications for humanity are enormous. Let's talk about what's happening in the Ukraine right now. I mean, a large part of it is a battle over oil. You know, it's Vladimir Putin basically using his power over fossil fuels to try and bully Europe into turning a blind eye to his authoritarian intentions in the Ukraine. Um, Imagine if all of a sudden, overnight, fossil fuel producers in the world were made irrelevant because something came to light that disclosed the capacity to draw huge amounts, massive, infinite amounts of energy from the vacuum. We know that the theoretical possibility for that exists in, physical idea, in physics ideas. It's just that nobody's yet been able to explain the science. You know, we've still got scientists trying to describe fusion and there's been limited attempts notably by british scientists in particular to um to contain a fusion reaction but imagine if as the implications of this technology seem to suggest 
somebody or, or something has mastered that technology ahead of us. Imagine if that suddenly came to light. Wow, the world would change instantaneously. I really, really hope people are absorbing and really just taking in what's being discussed right now and the implications of where we might be in the next two, three, four years, um, because it really does feel like things are accelerating at a at a rate that is uh, it's getting quite impressive. Is this the kind of stuff that you uh, that you wrote in your letter to the Clintons when you decided to send them a little <laughs> uh, little cheeky letter? Look, I, 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 I met somebody who had a capacity to, um, they assured me, get a letter directly into the hands of Hillary Clinton. And I've written to the Clinton Presidential Library before. I've written to all the presidential libraries and been forlornly rebuffed with the very polite letters. Um, but I wanted to give... Hillary, in particular, an opportunity to explain something that has never been explained. And I mean, if you think about how tame and pathetic the American media are, that when these leaked Podesta emails came out into the public arena during the election campaign, the media got focused on, frankly, a lot of theories and conspiracy theories about Russian intervention in the American election that as yet have not been borne out with sufficient evidence to justify a conclusion. Um, but in their zeal to, I think, push a progressive agenda, frankly, because they hated Trump and they, 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 they loved the idea of a Hillary Clinton vote uh, win, they, um, they, they didn't investigate hard enough the implications of some of the other emails that were disclosed in that bundle of DNC leaked emails. And among them were these extraordinary revelations that, you know, one of Hillary Clinton's principal advisors was, dis was discussing with two Pentagon generals, Tom DeLong of Blink-182 and Robert Weiss of Lockheed Martin, some kind of disclosure. There was clearly a rollout of UAP disclosure planned by a Clinton presidency. Everybody assumed Clinton was going to be the president in 2017. She did. I did. Everybody did. And of course, Trump's election was a huge upset. This is now the period where we're now looking at who's going to be the next president. And I think both sides of politics have realized there's, there's votes in them, their UAP hills. You know, I think people have realized behind the scenes the implications of those emails. They've realized that Hillary was onto something. And privately, you know, I'm, of course I'm talking, as, as are many people, to uh, both sides of politics on the hill. I think you've spoken to people on the hill as well. There is a clear sentiment there that they realize that they've been bullshitted for so long and they're not going to let it happen again. And what I'm taking heart from is the fact that people have come to that realization. And so the, what I wrote in my letter to Hillary Clinton was basically an invitation to her to explain what was going on back in 2016. Why was John Podesta talking to Robert Weiss of Lockheed Martin and General Neil McCasland, formerly from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Foreign Technology Division, and General Michael Carey, formerly from Space Command? Why were they talking about some kind of disclosure pertaining to UAPs? Why did Tom DeLong reassure um, John Podesta that he'd been told by the general presumably General Neil McCasland, that Roswell was real, that it did involve a retrieved alien spacecraft. But you know the big question in my mind? The big question in my mind still is, why is most of the US media asleep at the wheel on this issue? Why? That's the thing I don't understand. And, you know, I think the, um, the simple fact is that sooner or later, a national security or defense correspondent of renown is going to start asking questions. And that will be the turning point. It might be a Bob Woodward. You know, the day will come, I think, when somebody of Bob Woodward's reputation will go, gee, <laughs> there really is something to this, you know. Uh, and uh, it's funny because uh, I think I've mentioned before, I've, I've got mates who are investigative journalists all around the world. And 
I do detect the beginning of an inkling in their minds that maybe I'm not barking up the wrong tree. Maybe there is something to this. And I think the, um, the, the simple fact is that I, a lot of the media have allowed the stigma and ridicule that's been attached to the subject to excessively influence their willingness to engage with it. And, you know, I mentioned in an article that I've written that I've put up on the Seven TV Network's website today, I mentioned Dennis um, Kuchunich, I think is his name, who was a, a presidential candidate in 2008. And imagine this. So that's uh, 14 years ago, a guy running for the president, looking really good and quite an interesting candidate, was foolish enough to confirm that he had seen a UFO. And that pretty much destroyed his presidential campaign. In 14 years, we've come a long way because now we have public officials, former directors of the CIA. I mean, <laughs> James Woolsey, for God's sake, talked yeah. publicly. And I, I mean, you know, you had him on, didn't you? Didn't you have uh, him on? No, I didn't have James Woolsey on. I oh, I've forgotten Admiral, who it was. But... Admiral Bobby Ray Inman. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But James Woolsey basically said he knew a pilot whose plane was physically stopped in midair. Yeah, he did say that, didn't he? No. You know, this is a former director of the CIA. Yeah, I guess it's, guess it's nothing. This. Guess it's not and a big you know, deal. I, I, I don't know what goes deal. on inside the offices of the Washington Post or the um, you know the August offices of the Los Angeles Times, but do they sort of go, oh, yeah, Woolsey said that a UFO stopped a plane in midair? Oh, yeah, moving on. Yeah, yeah anyway, what, what anyway, is, next, next, yeah, next moving story. Moving on, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so crazy. You know, Woolsey's obviously gone crazy, but is Avril Haynes going crazy as the director of national intelligence when she talks about extraterrestriality as being a possible explanation for this phenomenon you know i i mean i've forgotten who the other um, cia director was but um you know th there are people openly discussing the possibility that this is a, some form of non-human intelligent life mm -hmm. why are we so scared of engaging with that it's fun i mean i love it as a journo it's a great story and I love the fact that, frankly, a lot of my colleagues in the media are too scared to go near it. Stay away, guys. I don't want you there. I'm enjoying the dig. You know, it really is. It's, um, it's, it's a fascinating time in human history. And eventually it will come up. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, like you said, fun on a on a journalism level. I'd love to ask though, how you feel when you just have those kind of silent moments of of kind of contemplation about this subject and about the uh, the overarching implications of what it really means for us as a species and for our perspective on reality. Um, how how do you feel as an individual about this being potentially real that we are surrounded by? much more sophisticated intelligences. You know what I'm more fascinated by? There's that, but it's also the implications for where we came from. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and Lou Elizondo, I think one of the most interesting articles that's ever been written about Lou was a GQ, British GQ interview with him that ran. That's fantastic. That. Brilliant. I think brilliant. it was late last year. Yeah. And, you know, he started talking about human genetics and it's funny, I've, I've got a paper somewhere here, which is called the WOW paper. And it's written by a, um, a I think, a mathematician somewhere in Eastern Europe. And he talks about the unlikelihood, based on statistical, statistical analysis, that the human genome evolved the way it did randomly. And essentially, he's done a, a statistical analysis of the human genome, and he sees far too many patterns in it to reach the conclusion that this could have occurred by simple evolutionary processes of natural selection. And uh, it's a really fascinating paper. And frankly, it makes my head explode after about the first page. But I've, I've put it by friends of mine who are equipped mentally and with their training to be able to read such papers. And, and they say the mathematics is sound, that it holds. And to me, it, it's more fascinating to me the implications of not just the potential that we're talking about an advanced intelligence with advanced technology that may be operating on this planet. It, it could be that we're talking here about an intelligence that molded the development of humanity yeah. as yeah. primitive apes. 
Like I remember years ago when I was on the Sydney Morning Herald as a cub reporter, I met a, a molecular um, biologist and we literally spent an afternoon talking and, and I loved his brain. And I wrote a piece that um, I've still got a copy of it somewhere. But in the course of his descriptions of evolutionary biology and his account of the work that he was doing, he used the words cosmic shove. And he said that he couldn't explain the pace of the development of humans from primitive apes through to an advanced homo sapiens with a forebrain that was capable of what our brains are capable of. He couldn't describe that with the the levels of random mutation that you get with natural selection. And he said that the only way he could explain it was with a cosmic shove. And that's stuck in my brain all through my career. And so when you have people like Lua Elizondo, as he did, I think, in that GQ paper, talking about the possibility that whatever this is might have meddled with the human genome tens of thousands, millions of years ago, that's when it starts getting interesting for me. It really does raise quite fundamental questions of who we are as human beings. You know, could we, you know, the whole idea of God, maybe one of the reasons why the religious fundamentalists find, if they know the story, if they know the real story, find it so confronting is because their idea of God is confounded by the simple realization that God is essentially an alien intelligence that hybridized us humans from apes. Could it be as simple as that? Could we be some elaborate science experiment? I don't think that's too confronting an idea. I mean, frankly, I'm grateful I'm no longer an ape. But, um, you know, I, I think the interesting thing is, is that if there is an, an alien intelligence engaging with this planet, and seemingly benevolently in most cases, if it is, um, and this is the thought process that's going through my mind, you know, if it does turn out to be true, as people like Elizondo and um, Gary Nolan and many others are suggesting that there is some kind of intelligence operating on this planet that is non-human, why is it here? That's the bigger question. What's it doing here? And when you ask that question, that's why I felt that it was important to at least give voice to those experiences who talk about the abduction phenomenon, the cattle mutilation phenomenon people who talk about and make extraordinary claims about being experimented upon by non-human intelligences. Um, I'm not saying that's real, but if the implications are that we have a non-human intelligence on this planet, why would they be taking an interest in our genetics? Well, what's going on there? And why aren't we asking these questions? Frankly, um, I think um, uh, that that's the bigger issue uh, that, that yes, um, I take it as a given, frankly, that there is a non-human intelligence operating on this planet. I take it as a given that the United States knows a hell of a lot more than it's letting on. Uh, it's been sitting on it, and I don't quite know why it's been sitting on it. That's the thing that I find the hardest thing of all, is understanding why they've kept it so secret. But um, to me, the bigger question that I think we'll soon be addressing is what are the implications for the origins of humanity that lie behind this discovery. Yeah, this is something that I I really do have a, a lot of invested interest in and in just contemplating and thinking about is the just excessively novel evolutionary developmental process of the human species when you compare it to every, everything else on this planet. Everything else, maybe the only thing that I would set aside as a potential uh, competitor is the mycelial network of fungal matrixes that uh, exist below our feet. I think there's maybe something to be said about a planetary neural network within that, uh, that particular area of science. But in terms of a human... Uh, species and comparing it to everything else that we see growing and developing everything else is in this gradual lazy million to billion year uh, you know slope through evolutionary time and here we are these these weird little creatures um, that have these incredible minds this this weird access to a 
what I like to kind of almost call a hyperdimensional realm, the imagination, the, the, the realm of the imagination, this, this non-physical space that seems to be infinite in proportions in some way, where we draw all of our information, we draw all of our inspiration, all of our innovation, our creativity, all the things that are around me right now have come from the mind of a human being, apart from these plants, of course. Uh, they've come from the mind of the planet. But, uh, you know, everything in everything that we're surrounded by has come from inside this mind, from this non-physical space. And we're also the only uh, species on this planet that seems to have this weird incentive drive towards space, towards catapulting ourselves into the cosmos. And so I'm always wrestling with uh, what exactly is the evolutionary driver within us at some fundamental level that's causing us to be in such a hyper accelerated form of development. Is it an alien species? Is it uh, you know, something else that maybe we've encountered in our uh, ancestral history, perhaps the magic mushroom theory holds some weight as to, uh, uh, you know, influencing our neural capabilities. But I think there could be a, a whole mess of different reasons why we are what we are. And I definitely do not exclude the possibility that we have had intelligences interact with us, especially when you just kind of take into account the theological architecture of our human species and the kind of uh, early origin stories that we have from some of the earliest civilizations that we know of, the, the gods coming down from the skies and molding us in their image or molding us in their abilities. And, you know, these things shouldn't be ignored as just fairy tales when we have other things that are maybe suggesting that there is a mystery with our DNA. You know, one of the things that I feel very strongly, Jay, is that there has been, I think, an establishment Vatican of scientists mm. that have controlled the narrative on what passes for scientific objectivity. And I'm not going to name names, but essentially there are scientists who I think have taken astonishing and disgracefully unscientific positions on the phenomenon. Look, for, for the entire period since the Second World War and far earlier than that, there have been people who claim to have had sightings, experiences involving anomalous phenomena that to a large extent have been peremptorily dismissed by a large section of government, um, military, intelligence services, and the media. And we now know for a fact that that scientific dogmaticism against the phenomenon is completely unjustified. It has been driven by a deliberate disinformation program conceived by the Central Intelligence Agency and pushed through the auspices of the Robertson panel ever since the 1952 Washington DC flyover. I mean, people forget their history. They forget that what drove the decision and it's recorded in CIA documents to essentially disinform the public and to stigmatize the issue of UAPs by telling people that they were gullible to believe in them. The simple fact is that that was driven after a period when the American military was hugely embarrassed that it couldn't explain the Washington flyover incident. There was never an explanation given for why over two consecutive weekends, craft of some kind detected on radar doing thousands of miles an hour by seen by fighter pilots seen zooming across radar scopes in a blink of an eye uh, witnessed by thousands of people on the ground in washington dc why you know what that phenomena was has never ever been explained and in fact i i think it's fascinating that people who forget their history as you say you know they're condemned to repeat it and the, the, the thing that Bryce um, Zabel and I have tried to do in our Need to Know podcast is we, we often try and refer back into history to remind people of why history matters and how a lot of what's happening in modern UFO, UAP research has already happened before. And where we're at at the moment is not at all dissimilar to what was happening in the early 1950s, 70 years ago, when... A former director of the CIA, Roscoe Helen Cotter, took a very public position and accused his own government of a cover-up. And the media 
connived to, to collaborate with government and the intelligence services and the military to essentially shut down people like Roscoe Helen Carter. They were marginalized. They were dismissed as loonies. They were ridiculed and treated with contempt and stigmatized. Now, frankly, the same thing could potentially happen again. I don't think it will, but it could happen again. But people need to ask, you know, why? Why was this the effort? If it's all bullshit, you know, if there is no truth to the claim that the alien spacecraft have been recovered, that there's no truth, if there's no truth to the claim that alien uh, intelligences are visiting this planet, then why the cover-up? Why the lies? Why are they still sitting on videos that have been shown to congressional representatives and senators? Why can't we see those? If this is all bullshit, why can't we see it? The only other plausible explanation, and I really hope this is true, is that it's American technology. Mm. But then, of course, they've denied that. They've categorically denied that it is American technology. Do you, they've do you, do they've you think issued some statements. It, do you think some of it could be, though? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think there are people who are telling me that the US is developing craft. We know that for a fact. I mean, nothing, Nick Cook, I'm sure, would have told you that really nothing much has come out of Area 51 in the last 30 years that can explain the trillions of dollars that have been expended on black projects. Massive sums. I mean, it's it, it just defies explanation to me that the United States isn't in possession of new types of technology or weaponry. Um, and I, I sincerely hope they are because the world's looking like a very dangerous place right now. And let me say, if I was a Pentagon general or an intelligence chief, I'd be wanting to keep it secret too. But the difficulty is Congress, presidents, political leadership have been lied to. Now, somebody made a strategic decision to do that, but I know that they've been lied to. I'm just not sure exactly of what the lies amount to, but they have definitely been lied to. There's been a deceit. Now, was that done under cloak of some unknown, undisclosed presidential executive order? Or was it done criminally in contempt of the Congress? And are the people who are resisting the disclosure now concerned that if this is revealed, they face potential prosecution and criminal sanction? Don't know. Did you think you'd ever be having these types of discussions in your career, mate? <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, no. And in fact, a lot of my journalist friends are, are very concerned that I'm going down this rabbit hole. You know, that they're, they're worried that I'm pissing my credibility up against a wall by giving no, it coverage. So. I don't think so. I think you're ahead um, of the curve. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, certainly all, I've, all I feel I'm doing are asking, is asking questions based on available evidence. I mean, you know, I've got a a couple of messages have come in while I've been talking to you where people have criticized me for even taking seriously the possibility that Jim Marlin might have non-human technology in his position. Why would people be so hostile to that? Yeah, that's the thing I don't understand is, yeah. you know, yeah. if it turns out that it's just a steel ball from some industrial process, great. That's Move great. On. Move on. Fantastic. Move on. Yeah. You know, and at least it's been tested and examined. I mean, it's funny. I, I like. I, I never understood, for example, why when people discovered what was called the Atacama skeleton, mm. why they got upset with Gary Nolan for essentially adducing that it was human. Uh, and, you know, there are all sorts of people who still believe that um, this tiny skeleton of what turns out to be a fetal uh, child baby um, with a deformed head um, you know, there were a lot of people who convinced that Gary participated in a dark cover-up for the sinister forces of darkness that are hiding dark secrets from the world. But the reality is good science was able to disprove a claim that many people thought was the case. And indeed, if that's the case with Jim's sphere, so be it. Uh, I'm not saying it is alien technology. I'm merely reporting that Jim thinks it is and that he attributes properties to it that he has witnessed himself and indeed... I know for a fact other people have witnessed multiple witnesses. And in fact, he's got video of some of it that, mm. that will be shown to Gary Nolan as part of Gary Nolan's investigations. Now, I think that's good science. It's great that a scientist is willing to engage and investigate in the same way that Gary's involved, as I understand it, still in an investigation of metamaterials. Uh, and, you know, those metamaterials analyses are still going on. And 
one of the things I pushed him on was the crater that was signed between the U.S. Army and the uh, that's the um, essentially a research agreement between TTSA, as it was known at the time, to the Stars Academy, now known as To the Stars, which is Tom DeLong's disclosure activist organization, and the U.S. Army. And the U.S. Army, and this is another thing I write about in my book, that <laughs> the U.S. Army agreed in a, a written contract with Tom DeLong's To the Stars to allow the investigation of metamaterials, which were purportedly recovered from alien spacecraft by different people, including metamaterials, some of which had come from the U.S. military itself. Why on earth is there no inquisitiveness by any mainstream media outside of our conversation into the fact that the US Army is admitting that it was in possession of metamaterials that it believed came from potentially alien spacecraft? Why is that not taken seriously? There's you know, more I mean, important I, things I, like, the, uh, like the Kardashians and you know, stuff I, like I that. Truly, I don't get it. And I mean, I, I think that all I'm doing as a journalist is applying logic to mm. evidence and asking questions, because that's what you do, it's what I do. Our job is to ask questions and to rattle the cage. And the interesting thing is, is that I think we're now at a stage where a wonderful institution like the US Congress is asking questions. And this is where I do get romantic. It's where I get a tear in my eye because, um, you know, one of the problems with our British system of constitutional law is that we don't have a Bill of Rights in our constitution. You know, the, the, the rights are inferred from common law, like the Magna Carta. But the, the interesting thing about America is that they've enshined, con, enshrined constitutional principles, such as the dominance of the Congress as the sovereign. You know, it's, it's basically boss not the Pentagon, not the intelligence services. And I do think that the problem is that over the past 77 years since World War II, there were people in the American military who took it upon themselves to conceal things from the American public in what they thought in a misplaced way was the public good. And I think that that largely fell by the wayside. It got overlooked by oversight committees, congressional watchdogs, the government accounting office, all of the traditional oversight bodies that have traditionally had a capacity to actually ask questions and probe allowed themselves to be snowed. And I'm in no doubt on the evidence that I've got before me, both on and off the record from my own sources, including people like Nat Kobitz, the former director of science technology development for the US Navy, that the United States has some explaining to do. And, and I think it's going to be a really interesting time in the next probably uh, year to 18 months as this story slowly unfolds. The only thing I'm really nervous about is that somebody in an effort to try and conceal this will do something rash that yeah. will divert public opinion. Yeah. Well, I'll let you go soon, Ross, but one, one other thing that I wanted to uh, quickly ask you, what was Congressman Burchette showing you in that documentary? We, we didn't oh, get to see wow. anything really, the blurry screen, but UFO. Yeah, no, we had to blur it. I promised Tim we'd blur it. Yeah. It's essentially um, a photograph of, of a Polaroid. It's a Polaroid. Mm. So it's an original Polaroid photograph. And it shows, it's multiple, actually. I think it's two. It shows... Um, the most incredibly clear shot I've ever seen of a kind of a hat shaped flying saucer. Oh, and okay. it's breathtaking. And as you know, it's very hard to fake an original mm. Polaroid photograph. So Tim's doing the right thing. You know, he's worried that he's going to get called a tinfoil hat crazy by just publishing that photograph. And he's been approached by somebody in his congressional district who's a friend of the family and he knows their background. He trusts them implicitly and they've allowed him to have the original Polaroid that's been in the family for quite a long time. Wow. And he's getting it photo analyzed and it's not the photograph itself that has swayed his opinion, by the way, he he's talking about other witnesses that he's heard on the Hill in mm -hmm. private conversation who've persuaded him that this phenomenon is real, but I applaud Tim congressional 
Congressman Tim Burchett for actually speaking publicly on this issue. Oh, yeah. We may not agree on all political issues, but I think it's commendable that somebody in the Congress has taken a public position in talking about what is an obvious cover up. And I mean, I've, I've, you know, bottom line is journalists are discouraged from believing in cover ups. We're always taught to believe that conspiracies don't happen and that if there is a cover up, it's often accidental. It's just a bureaucrat covering their butt. And it may very well be in this case, it is a bureaucrat covering their butt. It's maybe a Pentagon general who doesn't want to admit that they've lied to presidents and misled the Congress. I mean, why was the Obama White House allowed to put out such a misleading press release in 2011 when essentially it put the position that there is no evidence of any non-human intelligent mm. life engaging with this planet? The implications of what Gary Nolan has said publicly and what others are saying publicly is that there is a non-human intelligent technology engaging with this planet. And the implications of that are enormous. We've got to stop tying ourselves in knots, worrying about the stigma and worrying about what people will think if we start investigating it. Imagine if the incredible resources of the New York Times that have allowed Ralph uh, Blumenthal and Leslie Kane to ask to, to do the very limited stories that they've done. Imagine if their full investigative teams were deployed into investigating the people who've presided over the Special Access Program Oversight Committee for the last, oh, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Imagine if each of those people were approached in a public way by a newspaper of record like the New York Times and asked publicly by that newspaper definitively, what is the story? Do they really want to be in a position where they just say no comment and evade answering? The moment that a major newspaper or TV organization starts asking questions and rattling the cage and asking in a very public way, this will all change. The house of cards will fall very, very quickly. Truth has a way of wriggling out into the open. You know, it's very hard to keep a dirty lie. Even the secret bombing of Cambodia or Laos, you know, that eventually got out. Um, presidents have tried to conceal things in the past, like Watergate, like Iran-Contra. But in the end, it got out. And if there is, if there is this momentous secret of recovered non-human intelligence spacecraft that have been hidden from public gaze inside private aerospace for years, if the contents of the Admiral Wilson memo are true and they reflect a real reality that still, frankly, hasn't been revealed to the world, they will soon emerge because secrets like that are very hard to keep. I'll, uh, I'll finish this off with asking you what kind of conversation you feel we're going to be having in 2023? Um, we may not know all of the answers by the end of 2023, but I think by this time in a year, there will have been witnesses who will have rocked people's understanding of the world. Ross, you're a legend, mate. You're kicking down doors and asking hard questions. You are you're pushing for this in a way that, in all honesty, it shines a light of inadequacy on the vast majority of mainstream journalists who aren't even close to being at your level when it comes to researching and presenting information to the wider public on an issue as critical as this. You are appreciated by all of us who know just how hard you work to get this information out there. And I want to thank you for doing what you do so well because it pushes the ball forward and that's what everyone in this research community wants to see happen so thank you my friend for doing what you do thank you to you too and thank you to your listeners and your viewers frankly uh, all i ask is that they keep on writing long and demanding letters to their congressional representatives shake the cage the wheel that squeaks gets the grease <laughs>